studios of KPFK Pacifica Radio in Los Angeles. This is Uprising and I'm Sonali Kohatkar. It's Thursday, December 11th, 2014. The Senate Intelligence Committee's report on the CIA's barbaric treatment of war prisoners in the post 9-11 years is finally made public. We'll speak with Glenn Carl, a former CIA agent and in fact the most senior CIA member to write about his experience as an interrogator in his 2012 book called Simply the Interrogator. That's coming up after the news. Joining us now to break down today's headlines is our newest analyst, Chenjerai Kumanyika. He is an assistant professor of communication studies at Clemson University, South Carolina. Hi, Chenjerai. Hey, how you doing? And welcome to the program. Now, spurred by the release of the CIA torture report, the New York Times has published an expose of what took place in the early days after the September 11th attacks and how the CIA actually considered creating traditional prisons for captives from the Muslim world. According to the Times, the CIA considered a new prison system where everything would, quote, be tailored to meet the requirements of U.S. law and the federal rules of criminal procedure. And in fact, quote, the CIA's early framework for its detention program offers a glimpse of a possible alternative history. But we know that the agency instead created so-called black sites, where human rights were ignored and prisoners were treated cruelly, degraded, tortured, and sometimes killed. Meanwhile, the GOP-dominated House recently passed a bill to sanction the Venezuelan government for violating the human rights of anti-government protesters. Two senators have introduced a similar bill in the Senate. Venezuelan President Nicolas Maduro dismissed the move as, quote, insolent and, quote, imperialist. Now, Chenjirai, when I saw these two stories this morning, I couldn't help but pair them as an illustration of U.S. hypocrisy. Do we have any moral standing left to criticize other governments? Um, I think we have very little. And, you know, what I think is so interesting about what we now know about the early CIA framework is that it shows that different uh, options were, were considered in this process of deciding how the war on terror was going to be uh, continued and intensified in the wake of uh, September 11th. And so what we see is that, you know, uh, the CIA put on the table, looked at CIA, CIA legal analysts, looked at the possibility of affording to people who were accused terrorists the same rights that American prisoners would have. People would be housed in military detention facilities. And that this was essentially rejected and they decided to go with these black sites um, one of the first uh, of these um, having to do with, you know, uh, Abu Zayad's imprisonment. And this is where this, uh, you know, completely illegal and egregious torture took place. And we'll have more on the CIA torture report after the news flash. Thousands of Palestinians are mourning the death of a high-level Palestinian minister who was assaulted by an Israeli soldier. Minister Ziad Abu Ain was participating in a protest in the West Bank city of Ramallah when, according to Al Jazeera, quote, an Israeli border policeman shoved and grabbed him by the throat. Mr. Abu Ain died soon after. Even though an Israeli autopsy maintains that he died from a heart attack, Palestinians see Israel as responsible. Abu Ain's funeral was attended by top Palestinian officials, including President Mahmoud Abbas and negotiator Saab Erekat. Mr. Erekat warned Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu that he, quote, cannot continue to have a cost-free occupation. Well, Chenjerai, tensions have been high in various parts of occupied Palestine, from the war in Gaza this summer to the clashes over the mosque in East Jerusalem. Do you think that uh, this minister's death could spark a third intifada as Israel fears? Well, you know, I think that what uh, Israel should pay attention to is what's actually happening in the U.S. because there's uh, striking similarities where you have a um, an activist who is, you know, we have the Reuters photographer who says that he, he saw this person being grabbed in the neck um, and struck by tear gas cans, and yet the Israeli government has not ex accepted any responsibility. There, we find that their uh, autopsy report contradicts the joint autopsy report between a Jordani a Jordanian um, Israeli and Palestinian authorities who, you know, concluded that he, his death was a result of uh, this at attack on a peaceful protest. And so what we've seen is attacks on peaceful protesters and these sort of ability of corrupt government bodies to capture the legal apparatus has caused widespread protests in the U.S., so they should certainly be prepared for that. And finally, and yet another sign that the movement against police violence in the United States continues to grow, medical students organized major actions this week 
at more than 70 medical schools, including Yale and Harvard. Dubbed hashtag white coats for black lives, the action brought together students and faculty members, some of whom staged die-ins on campuses and even blocked traffic. Chinjoy, how important are such actions? I think these, inf these actions are important uh, for a number of reasons. One is they're bringing a wide uh, body of support to these protests. And as we see different regions come into play and we see, you know, we've seen athletes, we've seen students, we've seen high school students, now medical students, what we're actually seeing is also different issues being brought into play. So with the, so with the White Coats for Black Lives, we're also seeing uh, students, for example, at Johns Hopkins raise the issue of health disparities as part of the larger social justice effort. Well, I uh, want to thank you so much, uh, Chenjerai, for joining us today. Our newest news analyst, Chenjerai Kumenika, is an assistant professor of communication studies at Clemson University in South Carolina. Thanks so much. Thank you very much. This is Uprising. We'll be right back. This is Uprising. I'm Sonali Kohatkar. After many months of battling the CIA, the Senate Intelligence Committee finally won the right to make public an executive summary of a groundbreaking report detailing the extent of interrogation methods used on 9-11 era prisoners of war. The agency fought tooth and nail to keep the report secret, saying it would have repercussions on U.S. troops worldwide. The Obama administration sided with the CIA on secrecy. And in the last days ahead of the release, even Bush era officials began speaking out. President George W. Bush himself defended the CIA, saying, quote, We're fortunate to have men and women who work hard at the CIA serving on our behalf. These are patriots. Whatever the report says, if it diminishes their contributions to our country, it is way off base, end of quote. Former Vice President Dick Cheney went further, saying, quote, what I keep hearing out there is that they portray this as a rogue operation and the agency was way out of bounds and then they lied about it. I think that's all a bunch of hooey. The program was authorized, the agency did not want to proceed without authorization and it was also reviewed legally by the Justice Department before they undertook the program. That's what the former Vice President Dick Cheney said. The CIA report details the gruesome effects of waterboarding, euphemistically calling it, quote, a series of near drownings as well as a practice called rectal feedings. In fact, the extent of the torture was so great it has prompted the UN Special Rapporteur to call for prosecution of high-level officials involved. What the report also revealed is how badly the interrogation program was managed, how CIA officials exaggerated claims about the program's success in intelligence gathering, and how concerned officers were routinely dismissed how more than two dozen prisoners were actually wrongfully held in custody. We turn now to Francis Boyle. He is a professor of international law at the University of Illinois College of Law. Welcome to Uprising, Francis. Well, thank you very much for having me on and my best to your listening audience. And keep up that great work at uh, Free Speech News. Thank you so much for joining us. Now, how important uh, is it that this report was made public? It's not as though we did not know the CIA was torturing people, calling it enhanced interrogation. Much of what we see in the report or bits of it have been leaked over the years. Even the, at the height of the program and the war, we did know that the CIA uh, had these extraordinary rendition programs, that people were, in fact, being tortured. Why is this report so significant? 
Uh, you're correct about that. If if you, tr I'm slowly working my way through the report. It's the end of the uh, semester here. The only fact that that really has come out that I previously was not aware of was the so-called uh, rectal feeding, uh, which is really rape under mm. uh, international criminal law. These men these men were raped. I think there were five of them at least that we know of. Uh, so that you know that's a euphemism. The the importance here is this, that we now have um, an official branch of the United States government uh, that has made these uh, findings of fact. It, it appears that they deliberately uh, refuse to make any conclusions of law in, in the uh, 550 pages they have released, although apparently there is a section in the 6,700-page report uh, dealing with the uh, bogus legal justifications uh, for for all this uh, torture. Uh, but but the bottom line, this this is very important uh, because well, you know, I have a uh, complaint already filed uh, with the uh, uh, International uh, Criminal Court. Uh, for torture and enforced uh, disappearances hmm. of uh, uh, human beings against Bush, Cheney, Rumsfeld, uh, uh, Condoleezza Rice, Kennett, uh, and uh, 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 all the lawyers who were the enablers, including uh, you out there uh, on the West Coast. It's a disgrace that Berkeley gave him uh, an endowed chair, and I think shows how sick and demented Berkeley Law School has become, hmm. uh, certainly uh, over the years. And so I will be filing this uh, document uh, with the uh, International uh, Criminal Court uh, in support of my uh, complaint and urging them to uh, 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 open uh, an investigation. Because, you know, legally, and with all due respect to you and your colleagues in the press, um, you know, we, you Official reports legally are far more uh, important and relevant and material uh, than press accounts. Absolutely. That technically qualify as uh, hearsay. And I, I don't mean to diminish. No offense taken, of course. The, the important work, I mean, it's really journalists who uh, uh, broke this story and led uh, to, to this uh, document and, and public pressure. But legally, this would constitute what we lawyers call uh, an admission against interest uh, by the uh, United States government. Uh, it could be used for both uh, civil proceedings and criminal proceedings. Uh, when I filed my uh, complaint with the ICC that's still currently pending, it's about a 90-page complaint, the essence of that complaint uh, was the uh, Dick Marty uh, report by the reports by the for the uh, parliamentary assembly for the council of europe and these were official uh, investigations that mr marty uh, conducted having access to official government documents uh and that was the essence of my complaint and then it was supplemented uh by news media accounts for example uh in my complaint i had estimated that there were about 120 disappeared and uh, tortured Muslim Arab uh, 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 men. And that figure I got was from the Washington Post. And sure enough, it has now been confirmed uh, in, in the Senate committee report. They have an appendix uh, with everyone's name in there. Their figure is 119, and they say there might be another six somewhere. Uh, so again, I, I don't mean to diminish uh, the the significance of any of the great work done by investigative reporters in the news media, but but legally this is a big difference. Right yes. now, Francis, there, this report has revived the whole question of whether torture actually works. With even opponents of torture using it as a way to say uh, we shouldn't torture because torture doesn't work. But should that even be part of our discussion? Torture is torture. Even if it did work, it wouldn't be right. Of course not, and and as a, you're perfectly correct. And uh, as a matter of fact, uh, in the uh, court martial of Lieutenant uh, uh, Watada up there on the West Coast, I I appeared as an expert witness on his behalf on the laws of uh, war and belligerent occupation, and we dealt with torture 
and during my uh, testimony under oath subject to cross-examination by JAG lawyers, I pointed out that before September 11, 2001, the Pentagon itself, the professional interrogators at the Pentagon, had drawn up a manual for interrogation during wartime by the Pentagon. And if you read the manual, which I did and I testified, uh, it expressly ruled out torture, cruel, inhuman, and degrading uh, 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 treatment, both as a matter of principle and law, and also as a matter of practicality, that it simply did not work. So that was the uh, Pentagon's official position, uh, even by uh, uh, Pentagon interrogators, for wartime purposes. So there was no excuse for any of this uh, when uh, uh, Bush came in. If the uh, Pentagon uh, field manual had just been applied uh, by the Pentagon, and, you know, I, I don't believe the CIA should have been involved in any of this. These right. were uh, also um, what we call enforced disappearances of human beings, extraordinary rendition. That's a crime. That, that's a crime against humanity. But if that Pentagon uh, manual had simply been uh, employed, uh, none of this would have happened. There, there might have been some small-scale torture. Uh, that, that always happens in times of armed conflict. Uh, but but it, it wouldn't have been a matter of crime. policy. Of course not. Right. And, and, it, and indeed, you have to understand, it was a matter of official policy right. uh, before 9-11-2001, uh, even as officially advocated that by the Pentagon, that by Pentagon interrogators, that torture, cruel, inhuman, and degrading treatment was completely excluded uh, from any form of interrogation. And so, Francis, then what do you make of the New York Times revelations uh, just this week, uh, released in uh, tandem with this report that the CIA initially in November 2001 considered creating a prison system of similar standards as U.S. prisons, which are, of course, terrible places to begin with, but still uh, perhaps not compared, uh, you know, wouldn't have compared us to what we see now. Instead, the CIA decided to create the system of so-called black sites and extraordinary rendition. Had the U.S. Uh, decided, had the agency, had the CIA decided to uh, create a traditional prison system, we might not be here today and, and discussing this. Well, I want to make it clear that uh, all these uh, uh, human beings were certainly entitled to be treated, and those on Guantanamo today are still entitled to be treated uh, in accordance with the standards set forth in the Geneva Conventions. Uh, and they are not. And if the Geneva Conventions had been applied, uh, uh, none of this would, in my opinion, would have occurred. There, uh, obviously, it, on a massive uh, scale or, or as a matter of uh, uh, a policy, that is correct. And what really uh, led to, to these decisions uh, uh, it, it, it is unacceptable. Mm -hmm. uh, but if they had applied the Geneva Conventions in the first place, uh, we might not have had this scandal by the CIA and certainly the uh, Abu Ghraib uh, scandal as well. I, was, I, I helped uh, defend uh, Staff Sergeant uh, Camilo Mejia, the first resistor right. to uh, uh, Bush Jr.'s Gulf War on the grounds of torture, that he saw the torture going on there. Although this would not be, uh, uh, even if uh, uh, the Geneva Convention uh, uh, provisions had been applied that cannot excuse the CIA uh, kidnapping people uh, for any reason uh, because uh, that's a separate crime uh, enforced disappearance of uh, human beings uh, 120 of them at least that we know of and maybe another six and that is uh, widespread and systematic so the the kidnapping alone the the extraordinary rendition which is a euphemism that also would constitute a crime against humanity. So that's that's really what we're dealing with here, very serious uh, uh, criminal offenses. Very uh, briefly then, finally, uh, Francis Boyle, what do you think at this point needs to happen? You have filed a complaint with the ICC. The UN Rapporteur uh, has uh, also suggested criminally prosecuting high-level officials. Bush and Cheney, I highly doubt, fear uh, being prosecuted, but ultimately are they the ones who should be held responsible? 
Yes, I, I'm not going after any of the uh, lower level uh, CIA uh, uh, people involved. Not, not you know, not to exonerate them at all. There's guilty as sin, but. The ICC only deals with the uh, highest level uh, government officials, and that's uh, who I, uh, I filed my uh, complaint uh, against, as well as the lawyer enablers like uh, you there at uh, uh, Berkeley Law. I've also gone after Bush in uh, Switzerland, scared him out right. of Switzerland. Uh, I've gone after him three times in Canada and Cheney once, and right. uh, they were uh, both protected all four times by the uh, Harper government interfering with the uh, well, judicial process. So we'll, you know, we will keep after these people uh, around the world. There's thank no you. question all about it. Well, thank you uh, very much. The United States will do the best we can. Thank you very much for all the work that you do, Francis Boyle, and for joining us today. Well, thank you, and, and do keep uh, uh, up the fine work there at Free Speech News. Thank um, you very much. Francis okay, bye -bye. Boyle is my guest. He's a professor at the uh, University of Illinois College of Law, and he's written the book Tackling America's Toughest Questions. We turn now to Glenn Carl, a man who spent 23 years in the clandestine service of the Central Intelligence Agency, where he worked in a number of overseas posts on four continents and in Washington, D.C. He wrote the book almost three years ago now called The Interrogator and Education. Welcome to the program, Glenn. And we are going to try to get Glenn back on, uh, Glenn on with us. Uh, Glenn Carl, by the way, if you want to see the entire interview that we did with him nearly three years ago on our program, Uprising, uh, you can simply go to uprisingwithsonali.com and search for Glenn Carl. It's spelled G L E N N C A R. L E. You can also find it at our YouTube channel, youtube.com slash uprising with Sonali. He's a former CIA official and actually the senior most CIA official uh, who has written in the way that he has about the situation uh, in the CIA under the Bush administration and after the 9-11 attacks in the years during the wars in Afghanistan and Iraq. Are you with us, Glenn? I am. Thank you so much for joining us. Now, how important was this report for you personally? Your book details your experience, but uh, has this official report corroborated and in a way vindicated your work? Well, I think that it has in every, every way. I mean, I could be flippant and say that you could read my book in 300 pages and learn what it takes 6,000 pages of the Senate report to learn, but, that, but I don't mean that in a derogatory way. I'm being a little facetious. Uh, the, the report's very important. Uh, the real-time telegrams, communications, debates, discussions, arguments, and conclusions by hundreds of my colleagues um, showing uh, that the, the uh, program was uh, troubled and challenged and ineffective and, uh, frankly, un-American and unnecessary uh, is very important. And it's not that we are, are airing our dirty laundry and harming ourselves. On the contrary, we are strengthening ourselves as a nation to say, here are our ideals. We failed. We are trying to get it right. Many people have struggled hard to do this, and, and moving forward, we want to take this into account. That's a strength for a nation. So it's a very, very important and a good thing to, to, uh, to occur, although it's obviously a sad chapter. Now, when I interviewed you about your book nearly three years ago, I remarked that many parts of the book had been redacted by the CIA since you were forced to uh, let the agency approve of anything that you published. And I'm wondering if there's anything in the report uh, by the Senate Intelligence Committee that the CIA was forced to allow uh, to be published that uh, enables you to reveal material that had been redacted from your book. Uh, that's a good question. I don't really know the answer to it. I, I have not had a chance to read it. Right. It's um, a 500-plus page report, I should say, and that's just yeah. the executive summary. Um, I, I think the answer, is, is, so far as I know at present, and I believe it won't change, is, is no, that the, the conclusions I reach and the conclusions the Senate um, or, or make and the, that also that the Senate uh, committee uh, reaches are the same. And uh, those are not stopped by uh, the redactions to my book or the, or the redactions to the Senate report. Uh, specific details, yes, um, but but the uh, the main points uh, are not lost. And, and I'm confident, uh, having lived uh, all of this uh, episode in the House, that the Senate report uh, captures uh, the the issues and doesn't miss uh, specific cases or or uh, techniques or, or um, debates. That's mm. it, it captures it all accurately. Now, the 
report uh, it also suggests that the CIA misled Congress and provided false information about the program and its effectiveness. Did you have any knowledge of that when you were in the CIA? Well, I didn't have, I wasn't part of the uh, briefing uh, of oversight mm -hmm. committees at the time, but I'm not, I'm not saying that as a way to, to punt and avoid an answer. So I can't answer that directly firsthand. However, uh, I do know um, quite well how the, uh, the intelligence community presents its uh, operations. And so I, I write about this briefly in my book. What happens is the following, and this is the dynamic. I think it's understandable for, for anyone. It's not the, the secret CIA technique. You, you could say, uh-oh, oh, uh, here are our orders, and uh, what do we, we have to give a report on it. And you don't say, well, you know, we reached the wrong conclusions, we used the wrong methods, everything went wrong, even what we were trying to do, and, and it's a total botch, and, and this is really bad. You aren't going to say that. What you say instead is, uh, we have uh, faithfully and energetically executed our instructions. We constantly check our uh, pr procedures and our results. These are dedicated people doing excellent work, and uh, we are obeying the, um, the instructions that are given. And so, you know, both of those statements are about exactly the same thing, and they're totally different. And that, that's how um, things happen. Hmm. Well, Glenn, what about uh, people like yourself who attempted to speak out about uh, and express concern over the uh, practices of the CIA uh, and how detainees were treated? Um, how much is there in the report, or at least that you've heard of in the report, that suggests that there might have been um, some dissent within the CIA? Well, that is actually one of the surprises to me um, from the Senate report that it uh, discusses more dissent uh, documented uh, than, than I was aware of mm. at the time. It's a, it's a collegial institution, and uh, one it's not a debating society. So when the orders come, uh, as they're being elaborated, there might be heated uh, uh, discussion and, and dispute about this being right, this being wrong, we need to do the following, of course. Uh, but once the decision is made, we, we didn't sit around in the interrogation uh, antechamber and say, um, this is fundamentally wrong, we need to stop this. We tried to say, well, how can I, what steps can I take to mitigate things to get this right within the parameters of the, the uh, structure that I, I'm, I find myself in? And so that, that means debate becomes uh, much more muted. So I've been a bit surprised that there are, uh, I think, to the credit of the officers, uh, people who said, uh, Clearly, whoa, whoa, we can't keep doing this. We have to stop. Well, I want to thank you very much, Glenn Carl, for joining us today. And we will post a link to the interview we did with you about your book when you were on tour uh, in our studios at our website, uprisingwithsonali.com. Thanks. I tried to, to get to you. I'm sorry that there have been some technical. Uh, That's fine. Thank you so much. But I did my best. Thank you so much. Glenn Carl is our guest, and he has written the book, The Interrogator and in Education, worked inside the CIA for a number of decades and retired in 2007 and was one of the critics from within the agency of the CIA's practices of torture uh, of detainees. This is Uprising. We'll take a short break.